thank you, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Wally, and thank you all members for being here tonight. Um, it's really exciting to be able to talk about this work, um, both because this is uh, a chapter of a book that I'm uh, putting together currently that's aimed at a, at a broad, you know, well-educated lay audience who might be interested in numbers or might not yet know that they're interested in numbers. Because at first this subject may seem weird and arcane and abstruse, but which is a fundamental part of every one of our lives. And in the anthropologist spirit of, quote, making the strange familiar and the familiar strange, tonight I want to start with some examples a little closer to home before taking us into antiquity for some comparative examples. In 1792, the wealthy businessman, jo John Jacob Astor, wrote one of the first checks issued by the Bank of the United States, newly founded the year before by no less than Alexander Hamilton. See, you could be spending $400 tonight to go and learn about Hamilton, but instead, you're here. That's a deal. <laughs> I promise not to rap. Um, <laughs> then, as now, the structure of the written text of checks required a repetition of numerals, both in lexical numeral words, 1,550, as well as in numeral signs, 1550. Five, and this was to secure against fraudulent alteration and to reduce the risk of ambiguity of reading. This practice of dual notation is an essential norm of this text genre to this day. We all still do it, uh, those of us who still write paper checks, at least, even if we don't necessarily reflect very much on why we do it. This 200-year-old check has a familiarity to the modern eye, despite many other differences. Over a century later, the first edition of the Chicago Manual of Style was published in 1906, just a few blocks from where we are now sitting. Here, we see a dizzying array of rules and principles at play to answer the sim seemingly simple question, how should I choose a number? How should I write a number? We might prefer conciseness when writing 128 instead of 128. We might prefer aesthetics when starting a sentence with the words 593 instead of 593. By the way, the rationale for doing this is that sentences in English have to start with capital letters, and there are no capital numerals, so obviously we can't start it with just a 5. That won't work. This is the norm, but we don't reflect on that. We're urged to prefer two dollars written in words in ordinary reading matter, quote unquote, but dollar sign two with an ideogram, the dollar sign and a numeral sign, in matter, quote, of, an, of a statistical character. In other words, depending on genre. Years should always be written in numerals, even though the reader doesn't know whether to read 2018 or 2018 or something else entirely when we do so. We might prefer consistency across multiple numerals in a sentence whenever two or more of these principles come into conflict. All published writers have had to deal with the modern versions of these same rules, often to our own dismay, in the editorial process for our publications. Uh, once, when I was working as an editorial assistant for uh, my advisor, the late Bruce Trigger, um, he reported to me with alarm that the text I was helping him work with uh, uh, had been copy edited, and the word million had been replaced in every instance with the words 10 locks, and, in tw and 2 million was replaced with 20 locks. And it turns out, like as with most things these days, the copy editing had been outsourced to India. And in Indian English, the standard way of saying million is not to, not to say million, but to use this word lock which means 100,000 in Hindi and in Indian English. And so some editor had duly replaced again and again and again <laughs> these, these different numbers. These sorts of variations, these degrees of freedom in writing and reading texts, this is the subject of my talk this evening. Numerical notations are structured, complex notation systems that are typically used interdependently with one or more scripts. And scripts typically record language, but numerical notations like Roman numerals or like the Hindu Arabic or Western numerals 0 through 9 are graphic, relatively permanent notations that are not linked in inexorably or inherently 
to any specific language. The language of their reading is not dictated by their form. We can read them in theory in whatever language we prefer, and often we do. There are well over 100 structurally distinct numerical notations that have been developed and used from the earliest proto-cuneiform notations of the Mesopotamian city-states of the Uruk period over 5,000 years ago to the color band numerical notation used to mark resistors in modern electronics. Most writing systems, especially after the earliest ones, can be used to write language phonetically, including the set or sets of number words uh, of some language. And given the ubiquity of lexical and non-lexical resources for expressing numbers in writing, almost any numeral phrase can be written using a variety of strategies. So for example, here are some different English expressions for the same number, 1,200,000, and these are all taken from 19th and 20th century books. At no point has there just been one grammatical way to write 1.2 million. This might vary by time period, it can vary by genre, it can vary by the individual idiosyncrasies of the writer. How do writers choose? When can they choose? How do these literate norms and traditions constrain our choices? Recognizing that variation exists is the first step. Understanding and explaining the social factors and how those interact with the preferences of individual writers must then follow. We can actually take this 1.2 million example a little further and trace the rise and fall of frequency of different forms over time. This is using a tool called Google Ngram Viewer which traces the relative frequency of words and phrases, 100, over 155 billion word corpus of all English language books printed over the past several centuries. And we can actually see, I know you can't read it super well, but the blue and green lines at the top are, the, the blue line at the left is the, the uh, num numerical phrase 1,200,000, that to me is ungrammatical. I can't say 1,200,000. That's not right. I know what it means, but it, it isn't right. Um, followed by 1,200,000, all written out in words. And then in the 20th century, this other form, 1.2, with then with million in, in a word, that's this big spike that comes and basically persists to the modern, to the modern day, comes into existence. It was essentially absent prior to the 20th century, but now it's the typical unmarked way of saying 1.2 million and writing 1.2 million. Some of this reflects changing genres, for instance, the rise of scientific writing and the rise of modern finance. But some of it is about changes in formal style guides, things like the Chicago Manual of Style. And some of it reflects changes in taste and aesthetics. Now, explaining how and why these sorts of variability persist, and why these changes occur is no easy task, even for a contemporary world language like English. It's substantially more challenging to examine variation and choice in numerical expressions in pre-modern texts and pre-modern literate traditions. This brings us to a set of key analytical questions. First, what options exist in each society or in each particular literate tradition for writing numbers? Second, how does this variation correlate with genre, audience, medium? In other words, the kinds of questions that specialists in philology and epigraphy and paleography often ask about their texts. Third, how can we use this variation to usefully comment on scribal choice or, the, or writer's choice? My goal today is to contribute then to a historical sociolinguistics of numeration, with a particular focus on the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean, taking account of agency and variation within literate traditions. This starts from the recognition of variation, or simply put, the fact that things vary. They're not always the same. Here, what I mean is that number is expressible using a variety of strategies, as we've just seen. But just describing variation isn't enough. In using the concept of agency, I am stepping into some very, very tricky territory because in social science, this concept of agency is used everywhere and it's interminable, the debates, they're mostly unproductive, 
about what we mean by agency. So I'm just going to define agency as the ability of individuals to make meaningful choices between available options. In other words, I want to draw our attention not only to what sorts of options are available, but how writers select among them. Variation can be a key or a clue to agency, but it's not the same thing. A lot of the scholarship on numeration and number systems doesn't talk about this at all. It just assumes that there are ordinary ways of doing things, and you can look at any, any basic grammar, and it'll tell you here are the number words, and here are the number symbols, and that's the end of it. But part of the problem is that we, and by we, I'm actually, I include myself and other specialists in number systems, but I think people more generally, have tended to think of numbers as a technical solution to mathematical problems. But I think this is a mistake. I don't think we can make the error of assuming that this is the purpose of numerical notation. And the scholarship of literacy on literacy and writing systems is full of discussions of agency. And so I want to draw that same attention to variation and agency in number systems as we have for writing in general and for literacy in general. And then I think we can get to a more satisfying account of how writers chose and used the notations that were available to them. So when we're talking about choice in numerical notations, I very briefly want to introduce another concept. And this one is from semiotics, and it's the concept of modality. And modality is, is, includes the medium in which something is written, visual, auditory, etc. But it also includes the mode of its expression. So for instance, the concept stop can be expressed in speech, at the right, in writing, at the left. It can be expressed gesturally by an outstretched hand, palm forward, or simply through the ideogram of a red octagon. And I guarantee you, you will stop your car at a red octagon, even if it doesn't have a word on it. Please, please stop at a red octagon, for the sake of us all. But of course, modalities can and often are combined. A red octagon can be, and usually is, combined with the word stop, or a forward-facing palm combined with a scream, stop! These are what we'll call multimodal representations. In other words, they're using two or more modalities simultaneously. And we can see that all of these solutions, are, are all, all these modalities are also found in number systems. So this is the same basic issue as how to write 1.2 million. Numerical notation and written number words are two different modalities. They're both visual, they're both written, but they co-occur and they work together to convey a meaning. So we can call these multimodal numbers. They're ones that combine modalities in various ways. So let's have a look at how some written traditions do so. Now, at one end of this, the spectrum, there are a few writing systems that actually have no numerical notation whatsoever. In other words, numbers have to be written out in words. And so most of the scripts of uh, island Southeast Asia, of, of Indonesia and the Philippines, numbers, there's lots of numbers, but they're always written out in words. There's no corresponding numerical notation. And then there are some weirdo scripts like Olam in Ireland that just because of the nature of the genre doesn't express any numbers at all written, lexical, it's a lot of names and stuff like that. But we have no idea, but as far as we can tell, there were no numbers. People must have had spoken numbers, but they didn't have any reason to write them down. So we can see these examples where basically there's only one choice of modality, and that is the choice of written language. Now, that is not too big of a problem, if you have a phonetic, relatively phonetic script, well, and a, then you can write some numbers. So in a sense, numerical notations are redundant in that case. Now, on the other hand, the prevalence of numerical notation and not number words in the various early, very early script traditions is striking. So we see here at top left the San Andres Cylinder um, from La Venta in Mexico. The top right, we see a Chinese uh, Shang Dynasty oracle bone. The bottom left, we see the tags found in tomb UJ from Abydos. And at right, we find the proto-cuneiform tablets from Uruk and Jemdet Nasser. And in all of these early writing systems, numerical notation is really early, essentially right at the beginning of the written tradition. 
But also, in all of these traditions, numbers aren't written out in words hardly at all, very, very rarely. And this has suggested to some writers, including me, that numerical notation is in some sense a precursor of writing. I wouldn't go so far as to say that it causes writing to emerge, that's too strong of a claim, but it is some sort of precursor notational system. And how that exactly works is a really interesting puzzle, and I've been puzzling with it for 20 years and will continue to do so. Um, Egyptian, let's move on to Egyptian, because it's really an extreme case. Basically, all of what we know of the Egyptian number words comes from a very, very small number of Old Kingdom pyramid texts and then from Coptic. Very, very light stuff at the very, very end of the Egyptian tradition. For the most part, when Egyptians wrote numbers, they always used numerical notation. Tens and tens of thousands of inscriptions, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of numbers, and nobody thought, maybe we could write the word out. And um, this includes both the monumental or hieroglyphic script and the cursive scripts, hieratic and demotic. Um, basically, all of the numbers are notation. And in fact, uh, Jim Allen's uh, Magisterial Grammar of Middle Egyptian addresses students uh, and advises, I guess correctly, that, quote, it is not necessary to learn all these number words in order to read hieroglyphic texts. But think about that for a minute. It's a strange claim. If I went into my French class and they said, well, you don't really need to know the number words. This would be an odd claim. You would shake your head at me and say, Professor Chrysomalis, I don't really think you know French as well as you think you do. But in the Egyptian case, that makes some sense just because what we know is so ephemeral and so tangential that we're kind of playing with a very, very limited data set here. But it's really hard to believe that writing numerals out in words would never have occurred to scribes. Egyptian scribes wrote about all kinds of things. So I don't think this is a case where Egyptians just sort of forgot to write their numbers down. In fact, I think that some other principle must have been relevant. And I suspect that the norm at work was that it was part of the graphic norms of, of what it was a very, very conservative scribal practice that really lasted for over 3,000 years, which the Egyptologist John Baines calls decorum, or script decorum. In other words, it wasn't that Egyptian scribes couldn't have done so, or that they never thought of doing so, but that they chose not to do so. Consistently, over a period of 3,000 years, they chose not to write out numbers in words. This should surprise us. This should make us stop and think. And actually, this points to one reason why variation and agency aren't the same thing. In the Egyptian traditions, there's minimal variation, but I think that actually shows the agency all the more. It shows us, even when there were other options available, scribes chose not to write them. That's a really powerful kind of agency, and a very long-lived one. Now, linear B, the script of Mycenaean Greece and the Aegean Islands, is another interesting case where there's a near absence of lexical numerals in the thousands of clay tablets and other surviving texts. And we can speculate as to what the archaic Greek numeral words might have been. It wasn't so long ago. We know what, you know, we know what later Greek looks like. And indeed, we know pretty reliably what they must have been, but not from the texts. Instead, for the most part, very simple abstract notations, lines and circles, were used by both Minoan and Mycenaean scribes. However, the exception is all the more interesting for its relevance to the decipherment of Linear B. And in his famous, famous book on the decipherment, John Chadwick reprints a letter from 1953 from Carl Blegen to Michael Ventris, who's now recognized as the chief decipher of Linear B, and he writes in excitement about tablet P641 from Pilos. And shortly after Ventris's identification of some syllabic values for the signs, Blegen noted that the, the syllabic values that the syllables that, uh, that he had identified would cause this text to have this reading of tiripode, tiripo, queteroe, tirioe, queteroe, tirioe that correspond with these pots, which have, in the case of the Tiripo ones, three feet, 
In the case of the Quetoro way ones, four handles, and the Tirio way ones, three handles. This is exactly what we would expect from archaic Greek. Now, note that P641 actually contains three different modalities. It contains these lexical morphemes, these numeral morphemes, quetero and tirio, which anyone who studied Indo-European language will immediately recognize as three and four. There's this pictographic component of three or four feet, or, uh, or sorry, three feet or three or four handles. And there are these numeral signs, these little vertical lines at the end indicating how many of these things were being accounted for. So rather than thinking about this solely in terms of the value for the decipherment, I want to draw our attention to its graphic complexity as an index of scribal choice. For a scribe to represent the number of handles or the number of legs on a vessel in two different ways, both lexically and pictographically, on a small clay tablet, that's a choice. On tablets such as these, where space is at a premium, that's a really significant choice. The writer may have felt it useful or thought it essential to employ both forms, perhaps because there were less than literate or less than fully literate readers who may not have known words like tiripode, even though for Blagan and for most of us, the word tripod shouts to us across the millennia and suggests that the decipherment is right. But for a Mycenaean scribe or for a Mycenaean reader of these tablets, that may not have been evident at all. And so using these multiple modalities plays that role. They could have just done it with number signs. One, two, three, four vertical lines. It would have been nice. It would have been simple. And we never would have known. And this part of the decipherment would never have been possible. Now, sometimes the distinction between lexical and graphic is not so clear cut. And I will call these blended modalities. These are cases where when we look at it, we're like, well, is this a number word? Is this a number symbol? Is it a little of both? And often the numerical notation gives some clue. The best known of these systems, perhaps, there are a lot of them, um, that use blended modalities. Um, but one such system is the Greek acrophonic system, in which the signs for 5, 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 are simply the first letters of pente, deca, hecaton, helios, and myrios, respectively. But note that when they're written out as full number phrases in combination, Greek acrophonic numbers aren't just words. So for instance, for, to, write, uh, to write 30, we would just write D, 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 deca, deca, deca. But that's not the Greek word for 30. The Greek word for 30, uh, the ancient Greek word for, for 30 is triakonta. So it gives us a clue as to the meaning by giving us a clue to the phonetic value. But it doesn't really tell us the phonetic value of the word. It's really doing it in a more indirect way. Moreover, note that there are all these other things like vertical strokes. And a vertical stroke for one, that's not an acrophonic sign. So um, the Greek epigrapher, uh, paleographer, um, Marcus Todd, studied this system in detail nearly a century ago. But it was really only used for a small range of texts in writing dates or in writing the ages of the deceased uh, in a funerary inscription or in writing ordinal numbers, first, second, third. The Greeks weren't using acrophonic numerals. They were writing it in, in, in words. And so this really persisted actually for a couple hundred years. And then the Greeks invented a different number system, which is the alphabetic system, where alpha is one, beta is two, gamma is three, and then it goes up to nine, and then there's signs for 10 through 90, and 100 through 900. I won't talk about that tonight, but to say that there were a couple hundred years where there was kind of this weird blended system, but it was used sort of in various sorts of texts, but not everywhere we were, where we might expect it. Now, acrophonic numeration that blends modalities survives to this very day in Western notations, such as the use of K for 1,000. Here's the K in 2K18. This is from a promotional image for a popular wrestling video game. And of course, this is the first letter of the pseudo-Greek morpheme Kilo, which was stripped in the early modern period 
of the proud, mighty Kai of Kilios, and might I add, Chrysomalus. And then it was turned back into an acrophonic numeral for 1,000. It's meant to signal 1,000 to us. In Greek, if we know Greek, which we mostly don't, and, but we might have learned that kilograms have 1,000 grams, and we draw on this. Um, this practice originated in the 1960s in computing and electronic contexts, and it spread to salary figures in sentences like, she makes 92K a year in the 1970s, and then since Y2K, um, it's become this playful, hyper-modern, even though millennia old, strategy for representing numbers. It's no shorter than 2018 to write, and it presents uncertainty as to how it should be read aloud. Is this to be read 2K18? I think it is. But is it 2018 or is it not? I don't know. In short, it's a perfect example of what the linguist David Crystal calls ludic language. Language that's influenced by the human capacity for play, manipulation, puzzling. Another case of partial phonographic uh, representation using a blended modality is the Siak or Diwani notation. And this was used by Arabic, Persian, Ottoman administrators in, from the 10th to the 19th centuries. And in this case, most of these numbers that you see at left are kind of cursive reductions of Arabic number words. They're not Arabic number words. They can't be read quite as Arabic number words. And they're kind of used differently. So if you were going to say 422, you'd write the thing for 400. To the left of that, you'd write 20. To the left of that, you would write 2. Um, but it doesn't have to be read in Arabic. In fact, most of the people who were reading and writing it were Turkish speakers or Persian speakers. They weren't Arabic speakers. But they were using this system that was kind of giving them some sort of clue to what the Arabic phonetic reading of these words might be. So we could call this the visual etymology of these signs. It's a lexical origin for these signs. But their use wasn't as a number word. In fact, all of the users of Siak numerals were also fluent users of other numerical notations, like all of the Arabic and Persian and Indian and Western decimal positional systems that use 0 through 9, you know, like our system. That's the system they used every day. The role of the SIAC was actually a form of social control. It was to limit access to financial information to those who were initiated in its use, while providing a visual clue that might have been useful in teaching. And I think that's one of the things that might have been going on, although I don't know. Blending modalities, in this case, is semi-cryptographic. It's part of a set of accounting practices that are designed to limit the flow of information rather than to encourage it. Very briefly, to step back, a final example of blended modalities in unexpected contexts are phonographic numerals. So we use these all the time. Um, in this case, rather than the numeral giving a clue to the numerical value, the numeral indexes a phonetic value. Probably the best known numerical phonogram in English is K9, used as part of uh, a sort of a pun on the word K9, and gives me a chance to include a cute puppy, um, which I'm led to understand increases my audience 20, 30%. If you advertise cute puppies will be included, Chris, make a note. Um, and um, the use of numerals for their phonetic value remains frequent. Um, and, you know, Less than a decade ago, in the written language of youth texting, much to their elders' dis dismay, this was quite common. It's less so now. Kids don't really use two and eight as much as they used to. But it's not merely a modern trick. In fact, this is a long-standing practice. Here we see some Maya numerical phonograms. These three words are all chan. One of them is snake, one of them is four, one of them is sky. But a Maya writer could basically pick which one they wanted to use for representing any of those three words. So they're playing with this homophony. They're playing with the fact that these words are homophones to engage with readers in interesting ways. So before we dismiss kids these days, perhaps we should look to past scribal practice as evidence of numerical play. Now, 
Another thing we could look at, I'm going to call hybrid modalities. And these are ones that combine lexical and non-lexical signs in a systematic way. For instance, by alternating. Number, number word. Number, number word. And we saw that with things like 1.2 million. Um, and I call these hybrid modalities. They're not blended because you can still tell which is which, but they only work together. They work together to create the meaning of the number that you're meant to be reading. So one example of this is the case of Ableite numerals. Um, and uh, Chris, you know so much more than I do, so I'm going to pretend to know as much as you do. Um, it's a well-developed numerical tradition that uses this hybrid modality systematically. Uh, on thousands of tablets at the Palace Archive of Ebla in what is now northwestern Syria, dating to the middle to the last quarter of the third millennium BCE. And Eblaite numeration uses pretty ordinary sort of Sumerian, Akkadian type curviform or cuneiform signs for 1, 10, and 60. You can see them there. You basically just string them together like you would with Roman numerals. And the 60 is kind of a little weird, but if you study Mesopotamian numbers, 60 shows up everywhere. It's all pretty normal. But then for 100,000, 10,000, or 100,000, these don't exist. There are no numerical notations used for these normally. That normally, then, you just write it out phonetically. You just use the word. And so sometimes you actually could just use the first syllable. And at that point, you're kind of getting towards that acrophonic principle, the idea that you use the first letter or the first syllable of a sign to represent it. But let's have a look at an Eblaite text. And um, basically, uh, we will just look basically at this one register in the bottom left, where you basically see one. You can actually see the numerals quite clearly, or I hope you can at left. One, mayat. Eight, riba. Two, lim. Six, miat. And so that's 182,600. And in each case, the left-hand side is notational. They're just 1 through 10. They're pretty easy for anyone to see. Even uh, you know, if somebody who's never heard of Eblites before can be like, oh, I get that, 1, 8, 2, 6. And then red top to bottom to get 182,600. And this is actually quite a lot like 1.2 million, the kind of examples I showed you before. And it's clear enough. It's not exactly concise. Um, but it is, I think, a hybrid modality that perplexes me to a great degree. Why were they not just using the numerical traditions that were used in, Sumer in the sort of Sumerian, Akkadian, in uh, other Mesopotamian traditions? I have no idea. We could say it's an identity marker. That's usually the cheat that social scientists use when we don't know what something else is. Oh, it was for identity, so that it could be different. Uh, it's different. But I, I, would, I would only be saying that to give you an answer that sounds nice. If I hadn't told you all that secret trick, then you would say, oh, identity. But I have no idea whether that's the case. Um, we could also look at the case of Sogdian. Now, Sogdian is really interesting because in Eblaite, the, the low numbers get the notation, and the, the high numbers, the powers, get the words. In Sogdian, the reverse is true. So, um, I'm not an expert in Sogdian, but Nicholas Sims Williams, who assures me that this is actually a common practice, and I've given uh, some of his uh, work here, um, shows me that th this is actually the same principle, just in reverse. Now, this is a highly, highly cursive alphabet, and it's actually uh, it's being uh, read right to left, and you can see in each case, uh, do for two, followed by the numerical sign for 1,000, and then dui. 100 is 2,200. Um, and at the very bottom, you see pancha, pancha, 1,000, and abit, 100, 5,700. The weird one is the one in the middle, 24,000, where actually it's entirely written out in numerical notation. But this is interesting to me. It shows me that the Sogdians, it's not that the Sogdians didn't have numbers for 1 through 10 in numerical notation. That would be really weird but that in lots of cases they chose not to use them. And this really leads to the question of why was one strategy used in lines two and four of this inscription, but another strategy, which is you can almost, almost see it right at the left-hand side, 
of the, of the big long one, that's the 24, there's little four little vertical strokes. And that's, that's the four of 24. That's numerical notation. It's not a word. Why was this choice made? Um, one answer might be that the Sogdian scribe was trying to avoid something else, which was the sign for 10,000, because there was a Sogdian sign for 10,000. So they could have written two 10,000 for 1,000. But the sign for 10,000 is extremely rare. So the assumption might have been, well, I don't know if my reader is going to know that sign for 10,000. So maybe instead of doing that, I'm just going to go 24, 1,000, there, we're good, everyone will be able to read that, we're fine. So that's one possibility. But the question is, well, why didn't they write 24 out as a word? That would have been readable to almost any Sogdian who was literate. So again, you know, identity might have been relevant, but I think it's just as likely that some of the issues involved here are writers' assumptions about the degree of literacy of their audience. Because the numbers through, for 1 through 10 are among the first words that children learn in almost any language. New learners learn 1 through 10 really early. Maybe, just maybe, 24 was seen as a little too advanced, and we better do this in a simpler way. Um, so these are interesting. Now the third class of these inscriptions uh, are what we can call parallel modalities. And these are examples like John Jacob Astor's check from 1792 where you use two, but you use them in the same text, but in different places. And it's a sort of apparent redundancy, but it's actually very useful. So for instance, we see these in South Arabian. Now the South Arabian script tradition started in the early first millennium BCE. It's a variant of the various Bronze Age alphabets of, of the region of Arabia, Sinai, the Levant. But it quickly took on this very, very distinct appearance, very distinct monumental, very beautiful appearance in these inscriptions. And um, it was written in Bustrophedon, in other words, left to right, then right to left. The inscription or the line of text we're going to look at now is written left to right. And for the first several centuries of its existence, South Arabian was one of these systems where you just wrote all the numbers out in words. And then around the sixth or fifth centuries, as in this inscription from Sirwa, they started doing something else. But rather than just replacing number words with number symbols, they used them both side by side. And they surrounded the number symbols with these little hatched bars. And so you can see it right in the blue box, there are these little vertical hatched bars with six signs for a thousand in there, and that's six thousand. And the bit in the left is the, uh, is the, uh, is the South Arabian number word for six thousand. So, one possible reason for this redundancy is that numerical notation was really rare at this period. So there was no assumption that anybody knew it. They had it. The scribe wanted to show it off. It's really visually salient. It's really nice to be able to put in a text a number that everyone wants to see, especially you're announcing amounts of wealth that people have and things like that. You kind of want it to be visible. But we also don't know if anyone's going to understand that that's 6,000 as opposed to 600 or as opposed to just some scribble. So it's possible that the reason for this duplication is just that it was assumed that maybe the reader needed that for clarity. This is kind of like a modern check, but in a modern check we assume that everybody can read both. In this case it's not to double check the value. This is a monumental inscription. It's rather that it was to emphasize and make salient this new kind of cool uh, scribal practice, the numerical notation, a sort of emphatic flourish, but in a case where you couldn't assume that everyone was going to understand it. But in any event, it didn't last very long. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of South Arabian inscriptions, and only really a few dozen have numerical notations on them. And after the first century BCE, they stopped using them entirely. So it basically reverted to just using number words. Now, for us, we tend to a very often a very linear, progressive view of things where we assume that numbers are useful and having numeral no numerical notation is good. Why would anybody just give it up? But it's very clear that that's what the South Arabians did. They basically stopped using it, and they just went back to instead of using this double form, just write, just write it out in words, guys. It'll be much simpler.
We actually don't know why they abandoned it. It's a really interesting puzzle. Now, a related example comes from the very, very interesting uh, Greek text that Matt Stolper uh, introduced me to, um, which is the Persepolis Fortification Archive uh, Tablet Fort 1771. And this is the only Greek administrative tablet from Persepolis. And this is, of course, uh, tens of thousands of texts from around 500 BCE, and they're mostly in Elamite cuneiform, and some of them are in Aramaic. And this one solitary Greek example. At a time when Greeks and Persians were, of course, in contact, in contact and conflict, but not so much at Persepolis. Persepolis was a new city at this time, and there wasn't that same kind of intercultural connection with, with the Greek world. Uh, as Matt Stolper and Jan Tavernier rightly note, this is not, however, a misplaced text. This is part of the scribal practice of Persepolis. On, uh, on the left side, if we were to turn it, you would actually see that there's an Elamite seal on the, on, the, on the edge of it. And this is the kind of text that was all over them. Is, there are all kinds of texts like this, Aramaic texts that are like this, that recording this kind of information just in a different language. So this isn't something that just happened to get thrown away or happened to weirdly get there. It's really part of the archive. The language is different, but the function is the same. Now, here's the text, Oinos Duo Tu Maris. And Maris is a unit of measure. It's about 9.3 liters of liquid. And once you know that, you've got oinos, which is wine, duo, which is two. You actually don't need to know any Greek at all, really, to get this. And it looks like this number two, two marks, is redundant. Now, how is this meant to be read and understood? And how should we think about the choice to use both duo and two together? Well, unfortunately, we do not have a Persepolis manual of style to tell us how to read and write numerals. And neither did the scribe who wrote it at the time. Here, aesthetic preferences aren't really plausible. This is not a great monumental inscription. Um, in a really excellent recent article, Flavia Pompeo begins with the observation, it was actually first made by Schmidt in the 80s, that the two vertical marks seem to have been added later that just judging by the spacing, it looks like that somebody stuck those two marks in after the fact, and I think that's right. And her argument, and my argument too, is maybe this is for readers who were not fluent in Greek, because there wouldn't have been so many of those. But Pompeo notes that actually we can then ask more questions about these two little marks. Maybe those are Greek acrophonic numerals. That's after all, I just showed you that system. They used vertical strokes. But so did Aramaic. Aramaic would have used two vertical strokes. She points out that, well, of course, cuneiform scripts were using wedges, but it would have been two wedges. It wouldn't have been so different if it were an Elamite text or something else. There's no way to really know what was intended here. Maybe the scribe was just like, well, let's just put two marks. Those are just like tallies. Everyone knows that. That's just two, guys. Everyone knows that. We'll probably never know, but it bears on the question of who exactly added them and why. Perhaps a thoughtful Greek? Perhaps a mystified Persian? I don't know. One further remark, though. Imagine that the marks are there, but the word duo is not. Now, in this case, I'm not actually sure we'd believe that that's a two. I've encountered many of these texts, and people argue about them endlessly. Is that two eyes? Is that maybe somebody was writing something, and that letter didn't get finished? There's supposed to be something in between? We yell about this stuff all the time. We only know securely that it means two because they exist in parallel. Duo, two, Maris. One final example comes from the earliest part of the Aramaic script tradition, as used uh, in Assyria in northern Mesopotamia. Uh, this is the bronze Assyrian lion weight, BM91220, from the British Museum, uh, excavated at Nimrud, found by Layard in the 1840s. It's really early in the history of Assyriology, and it's really hit early in the history of Aramaic. It's probably from the 8th century, from the reign of Shalmaneser V, that's 725-ish BCE. And the social context of this period was complex. At the time, Aramaic were, was really a relative latecomer to the prestige language and writing of, of Assyria. 
uh, it had really only been recently elevated to the status of being a lingua franca of the Assyrian Empire under Shalmaneser's predecessor, uh, Tiglath-Pileser III. In other words, Aramaic was widely spoken in this region, but it was only tentatively a written and prestige language. And this lion weight is the only one of the 16 that Laird found that was uh, inscribed. It bears three inscriptions, two of which are Aramaic, and one of which is purely numerical. So on the right flank, we see this at the top, um, basically the weight of the object, 15 minas, is represented in Aramaic decimal numerical notation. There's a 10 plus 5 once, and you can see it written from right to left at the bottom, and I've transcribed it from left to right for you up at the top in red. Below that, on the base, the scribe wrote it, but just in, in Aramaic words. Kamshat Ashar, 5 plus 10. And then finally, on the left flank, and you can maybe almost just see it on the flank of the lion, it's really hard to make out on this slide, 15 vertical strokes. What motivated the scribe to triplicate this value of 15? Was it in part so that we could see the value both from the left and the right? Well, maybe you could, but then why do it three different ways? Well, was it to prevent fraud, as in check writing practices? Well, maybe, but this is an inscription in bronze. It's not that easy to alter, and in any case, the weight gives the inscription away, would give an alteration away. I actually think it's more likely that many of the users of the weight were not literate in Aramaic at all, and they might not have been able to read either of the inscriptions on the right flank. This makes it really important to just have the 15, just write it out in 15 vertical strokes, guys. That'll be easier. The tallies serve a clear and useful purpose in this context. But even those literate in Aramaic might not have known that decimal combination of a stroke for 10 plus five strokes for one, because this is actually the first unambiguous example we have of Aramaic numerical notation. So this is the first earliest one. It was clearly around a little bit before that, but it was a novelty. And so maybe the idea is, well, we're going to use the novelty, but let's write it out in words just in case, because we want to be understood. We want to be known. And so in this newly Aramaized Nimrod of the mid to late 8th century, the scribe may have been considering the ability of the inscription to be readable not just by him, but to a variety of potential audiences. Now, those of us who study writing and literacy are used to thinking about these issues about bilingual and multilingual texts. So most school children still learn about the decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs by learning about the Rosetta Stone. And we learn, oh, this was useful for, because you, know, you have hieroglyphs and Demotic and Greek and they're together and then this led us to cipher it. Okay. And of course, there's also a vast and growing literature on multilingualism of individuals and groups in antiquity, with code choice always being present. And these questions come up. Who writes, for whom, in what code, and why? And these questions are widespread in Near Eastern studies, in classics, in anthropology, linguistics, and numerous other historical disciplines. But in contrast, number systems are seen almost as needing no decipherment, needing no bilinguals, needing no explanation. After all, even where there are undeciphered scripts, we can often read the numerals. It's the only part of linear A we can read reliably are the numbers. We've been able to read them for over 100 years because they're self-evident. It was the same with Maya. Before we figured out that Mayan writing had a phonetic component, the numbers were the only part we, secure, we could securely read. This makes us think of numbers as something that are easy and thus not that relevant. And I hope that I've shown this evening that that cannot be sustained, that almost always there's some variation and some choice as to how to write a number. Even within a text written in a single language and intended for a narrow monolingual audience, there's, the writer is afforded opportunities to select some combination of expressions that suits a set of needs and goals. And these include some of the ones that I've discussed tonight. Multilingualism. We don't assume that every reader is fluent in a particular language or script, and so numerical notation serves as a translinguistic bridge, because it can be understood, in many cases, without knowing a particular language. <laughs>
Clarity is also really important. Numerical notation is highly visually salient within a text, and thus using numerals provides clarity. It makes the task of identifying numbers really easy, and reading them, in theory, easier, and especially where we have those parallel modalities where we can see that those two come together, each one confirms the other. This can serve the purpose of security, that using distinct representations saves us from a scribal error or from an alteration. It ensures that the number represented is the one that was intended. And then there are these issues of familiarity, that even that rare numerical notations, either very new ones or obsolescent ones, they may need some explication They're because, or they may need that linguistic redundancy. I also note that, curiously, sometimes they're more concise. So I've given you three examples of how to write 12 billion here. Almost certainly, if you were to write 12 billion, you'd probably choose the one at left. It also happens to be the shortest, but it's also multimodal. The shortest one is actually the multimodal one, so that could play a role. And finally, all of the set of aesthetic questions, because code choice involves these sorts of considerations that aren't purely practical. Prestige, modernity, playfulness. Numeration is not a mere appendage to scripts. It displays remarkable variation in form and function. It is not just math stuff. In fact, most of it's not for math at all. It simply solves the problem, how do I write a number? Because there are multiple ways to write numbers in almost every tradition, numeration is a rich source of insight into how pre-modern writers thought about problems of representation and notation. It also offers us opportunities to think about reading and readership in environments where familiarity with number symbols was almost surely more widespread than full literacy, except in the case of new notations where it may not have been. The set of anecdotes and case studies I've presented today are but a small sample of the range that could be elicited. I hope that I've inspired you to think differently about the ways that numbers are used and constructed in texts, both ancient and modern, so that, for instance, the next time that you encounter a South Carolina $8 bill from 1776, the same era when John Jacob Astor wrote his check, you'll see the text through different eyes. Viewing this text as a complex fusion of different modalities, Roman numerals, Western or Hindu-Arabic numerals, and English words, not employed haphazardly, but rather chosen by those who had the agency to select them and reflecting on why they made those choices, allows a richer understanding of all sorts of numerical material around us. Thank you. <laughs>